Well, hey there, and good morning and happy Easter Spotswood. My name is BJ, and we are so excited that you are here and you chose to spend your Easter here with us. As always, we have a ton going on and on the horizon, and we have all the details ready for you, so check out what's going on around Spotswood for you and for your family. We love our city, and we want our city to know the love of Jesus. So we thought, what better way to show them that love than to show up and pray? Next Sunday is our night of prayer, and we're moving that night of prayer to a new location, and we would love for y'all to join us. At 6 p.m., you're invited to meet up with us at Her Camp Park. We'll meet at the love sign to worship and pray for a bit, and then we're gonna scatter out into groups and pray for specific needs in Fredericksburg. Then afterwards, you're welcome to grab some dinner and ice cream together. It's gonna be such a great time, and we cannot wait to see you there. Ladies, you do not wanna miss out on our spring event on April 12th. It's gonna be an evening of desserts, fellowship, and fun. We're also gonna be learning a lot more about our missionaries in Newfoundland, Guinea, and Japan. We're gonna have a great guest speaker, April Bunn, from the International Mission Board, and a portion of the cost, which is gonna be $20, will go towards the financial support of our college students heading to Guinea, West Africa, early next year. Make sure you check it out and join us. Camp is just around the corner. This year, we're gonna be headed to Watermarks for an incredible week together. We're gonna to be focusing on the size of our God. So many things loom large for our teenagers, but if we'll just zoom out and see God for who he really is, we'll find our problems are right sized and our anxiety disappears. It's going to be a great week together and we want you there. Head on over to spotswood.org slash students to secure your spot today. Thanks again, church, for being with us this morning. If you came ready to give, we have a number of easy and safe ways for you to do so. If you came with that gift in hand, feel free to drop it in any of the drop boxes near the exits, or you can give online at spotswood.org give or on our Spotswood app. We also want you to stay connected all week long, so make sure you check out spotswood.org to find out what's going on or on Facebook or Instagram at Spotswood News. We love you, church. Thanks for being here with us for Easter. A great light dawns in Galilee. Some say madman, some say king. Wonder working rebel priest. Jesus Christ the Nazarene And he knew well what it would take To free us all from sin and grave A perfect man would have to die And only he could pay that price Friday's good cause Sunday is coming Don't lose hope cause Sunday is coming Devil you're done you better start running Friday's good cause Sunday is coming So we let those soldiers take it And betrayed him with a kiss and There before the mocking crowd Like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a sound So he carried that cross to Calvary And he shed his blood to set us of the world was on his heart. Friday's good cause Sunday is coming. Don't lose hope cause Sunday is coming. Devil you're done you better start running. Friday's good cause Sunday is coming. 
and bowed his head the son of god and man was dead with bloody hands tears on their face they laid him down inside that grave but that wasn't the end that wasn't the end that wasn't the end let me tell you what happened next the women came before the door When they looked inside, the angel said, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's alive, he's alive, hallelujah, he's alive. Give him praise, give him high, hallelujah, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, hallelujah, he's alive. Give him praise. Glory! 
How we doing, church? Everybody awake this morning? Let's stand, let's worship together. One of my favorite hymns, Because He Lives. That's the whole reason we're here, amen? We're not here to be entertained. We're not here for fancy lights or music. We're here to praise the risen Savior, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's alive. He is risen. Amen. Sing with me, church. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy. Church, you may be seated. It is such a joy to be here with you this morning. My name is Josh Morton. I'm the Worship and Fine Arts Pastor here at Spotswood Baptist Church. And I am just so excited to celebrate the risen Savior with you. He is risen. Amen. Amen. I want to read some scripture for you. It comes from Philippians 2, and it says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Before I continue reading that, that part where it says, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He knew that we could not make our sinful selves right. And so he sent his son Jesus to fix it. He sent Jesus 
for every one of you. Every one of you. He had mercy on us. And it goes on to say this, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Pray with me, church. Almighty King Jesus, you are victorious over all the things of this world and things that we cannot see, things that we cannot comprehend. You reign supreme over it all. You conquered death, hell, and the grave for us. Thank you, Father. I just pray, Lord, that this morning you see a group of people humbled in your presence, grateful that you would allow us here, thankful that you did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. We worship you this morning and no one else. Father, I pray that if there's anyone within earshot of my voice right now, whether it be online or whether it be here in this room, out in the foyer, I don't know where they could be, but Lord, I just pray that if they don't know you, if they've never acknowledged you as their Savior, I pray that today is the day they choose you. Because Lord, what better way to thank someone who gave it all for you than to give back? Lord, we surrender our lives to you. You are worthy of it all. Name above all names, Jesus. May you be lifted high and honored today. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.
seen kings all throughout history. They rise and they fall. But there's one king whose kingdom will never end. This king is holy, perfect in his righteousness, in his love, in his justice, and in his goodness, who left his throne, came to us, laid down his life, and conquered death itself. Today, he sits at the right hand of the Father, and one day will return to make all things new. This king is a king like no other king. He is risen. He is risen. That's a truth not just for Easter Sunday. That is a truth every day of our life, every moment of every day. We serve a king like no other king. Trust you brought your Bible with you today, maybe something electronic like I use so that I can actually read the text. Meet me in the Gospel of Luke. This has been our focus for the last couple of weeks. Chapter 23, verse 43. I also would ask you to mark Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, if you're using something electronic, it may be easier to scroll to. If you have a Bible, just put a mark there. In Hebrews chapter 4, toward the end of the New Testament. By the way, if you need a Bible, uh, there's probably one in the rack on the seats in front of you. Take that, use it this morning, and then that's, that's our gift to you. 
Uh, read God's Word every day. Start in the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John was written to help us understand that Jesus Christ really is God's Son. There are three distinct offices as you read the Old Testament that God used to reveal himself to his people. Prophets, priests, and kings. No one person in the Old Testament fulfilled all of those roles. They were separate and they were distinct. But Jesus, because he's a king like no other king, he didn't necessarily occupy the offices. He fulfilled all of the roles. And what I did a couple of weeks ago, I changed the order intentionally. And we begin our focus leading up to our celebration of the resurrection today reminding us of the fact that Jesus is king. In fact, we said Jesus out kings all other kings. And it's important for us to know that Jesus is king because we, as followers of Jesus Christ, live under his authority. Not only is Jesus king, he fulfilled that role, he also fulfilled the role of prophet. When I was a kid growing up in church, not paying any attention to the sermon, I used to just flip through the New Testament, and I was fascinated by all the pages where the words of Jesus were in red. Have you, you ever done that during the sermon? Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. I was just fascinated that, that when Jesus speaks, Jesus speaks as God, and, and that Jesus actually speaks to us the truth of God. He fulfilled that role of king. He fulfilled that role of prophet. Our focus today is on that role of priest because Jesus is the only one who reconciles us to God. The apostle Paul poured into Timothy. Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And if you want to find a culture that pretty much mirrors the culture and the chaos and the craziness of the 21st century look no further than the culture at Ephesus, first century. None of the markers were there. They were a pre-Christian culture, and I think today we are a post-Christian culture. So Paul, in giving instruction to Timothy, he wrote about in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, that, that Jesus is our mediator. So if he as priest is a reconciler, he reconciles as a mediator. And in fact, what, what Paul wrote is, listen, there's, there's only one God, and, and there's only one mediator, and when he describes that mediator, most of the time we would see or read or use the phrase Jesus Christ, but they are reversed, and I think it's intentionally. The mediator is Christ Jesus. That word Christ is, is a title. It basically means the anticipated one or the anointed one. The anticipated one, the anointed one, the Christ is Jesus, which means God's salvation. Jesus is a name. So as best as he can, Paul, in the chaos of that culture, identified Jesus, who is the Christ, as the only mediator. To me, understanding king, prophet, and priest, I think, gives us a better feel for the context of the verse that we're going to focus on today out of Luke chapter 23. I'm sure you know the backstory. Jesus has been betrayed. He has been arrested. He has been beaten. He has been tried. And now he is nailed on a cross, and he is crucified between two thieves. One of those two thieves, being crucified with Jesus, began yelling at Jesus, began verbally just laying into Jesus. And I think for us 21st century Verbally abusive would fit. Some of us in the room grew up in a home where someone was verbally uh, abusive. You may work in a place where there's a supervisor or, or a coworker who is verbally 
abusive. You may be in school, and there's someone at school who bullies you all the time. So what took place when Jesus was crucified, I think just pulls all of us into the story because we can understand what Jesus was enduring, not just physically and spiritually, but verbally there on the cross. One of those other thieves says, man, do you not even fear God? You're receiving, I'm receiving what we deserve. But, but this man, and, and he's referencing Jesus, this man has done nothing wrong. And, and he speaks to Jesus, and he said, Jesus, would, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Luke records for us, verse 43, Jesus says, truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. From that statement and that statement alone, clearly, according to Jesus, there is something that awaits us after death. Clearly, according to Jesus, there is something that awaits all of us Those of you who are joining us online, every person that you and I know, every person in the world, there's something that awaits us after the grave. Paul writing to the church at Corinth in the 15th chapter of the first letter that we have in our New Testament. Chapter 15, Paul writes, you know, if Jesus is still dead then out of all of the people in the world, out of all of the people who have ever lived, what we do as Christians is is just really sad. It's sad that we would live our lives and we would set a time, set aside a time to, to worship a dead Jesus. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, Paul says, but here's here's the Here's the reality. Here's the truth. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. In fact, the way Paul instructs these believers, and it's instruction that, that we need, I think, in our lives, 21st century, he references Jesus and that resurrection as first fruits. Out of the backdrop of the Old Testament, first fruits were always a promise that there's more to come. So for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, based on the resurrection of Jesus, we have something to look forward to. We have hope that Josh talked about, that our choir sang about. There's something more to come. I've been preaching three decades. And most of you would say, man, he hides it well. Thank you. Started when I was four, but I've been preaching for three decades. And I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who have asked me the question, what's the difference between paradise and heaven? Well, I'm not going to address that today at all. You have to come back another Sunday. Because I think there's a more important phrase in that conversation that Jesus has with this other thief. And it's the phrase, you shall be with me. I don't think I have ever had a conversation with anyone who came and questioned me about that phrase. So as your pastor, I want to spend some time helping you understand that phrase and then making some application to our life. Because the way Jesus spoke to this thief on the cross and the way the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to record what was said... You need to understand this, and I need to understand this, that Jesus was saying, listen, nothing, absolutely nothing, not even crucifixion and death can keep you from being with me. That's why I'm here today. And and I pray that's why you're here today. Because this same Jesus who made this promise to this man has made that promise to me and he's made that promise to you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, not even physical death 
that can keep you from being in heaven with me. How incredible is that? I mean, I mean here's, a, here's a man who just said, I, I'm getting what I deserve because of the life that I've lived. And he simply just asked Jesus, would, would you remember me? And here's what Jesus says to this man. He said it to me. He said it to you. We get from Jesus what we do not deserve. I don't deserve to be, be forgiven of my sins. I, I don't deserve to, to be a recipient of everlasting life. I've never met anyone who deserves that. So with Jesus, we get what we do not deserve. And the incredible thing about Jesus is we do not get what we really deserve. Because I'm... I certainly promise you, I, I, even though I'm the pastor, Judy don't chime in here, I, I deserve death because of sin in my life. You don't get to be pastor because you finished all the Sunday school classes and you're perfect. Something that God places over your life, it's a call, a responsibility to take the scriptures and make application. So let's take this scripture and let's make application. Really just one thought this morning. One phrase, I would challenge you to write it down. Here's the phrase, Jesus is my priest. That's the focus. We understand Jesus fulfilled that role of king. He fulfilled that role of prophet. He also fulfilled that role of priest. Priest represent God to man and man to God. And as our priest, it is Jesus who is the mediator of the relationship that we have with God. It is Jesus because of what happened on the cross that we are reconciled to God. So, meet me in Hebrews chapter 4. Flip over there, a couple of pages, scroll up, scroll down, whatever you need to do, because I believe the writer of the book of Hebrews did an incredible job of taking something that was very familiar to the Old Testament world and explaining that to the New Testament culture first century applicable to you and me in the 21st century. Now, I, I know a lot of us are here because this is what we do Sunday after Sunday. It's kind of the rhythm of our life. And we're here because not just on Easter Sunday, but every Sunday, we truly believe that Jesus Christ crucified, he died, he was buried, and three days later, he rose again. We believe that. But I know there's some in the room, and there's some who are joining us online this morning, and, and you like to believe that, but you're just not really sure that that's believable. So... What I want to do is, out of Hebrews chapter 4, explain to you why it's believable. And I, I know there's some say, well, you know, you're using the Bible. That's what you normally do in church. But here's the thing. There are five major world religions, and all of the religions in the world have a holy book that is their source book for truth. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ have the Bible, which I believe is God's word. It is our source book for truth. So if we want truth, we have to spend time in the Word of God learning and applying truth to our lives. And by the way, the majority of us in this room in 2024 are reading through the Old Testament. 2023, we read through the New Testament. I asked you just a couple of weeks ago to read through the Gospel of Luke, and that if you didn't have time to read through the Gospel of Luke, at least start at, verse, at chapter 19 and go through the end of the book, chapter 24. If you didn't know that or weren't aware of that, you can start today, not during the sermon, but you can start today and read those chapters. But I'm also going to give you homework from church on Easter Sunday. If you're thinking, that guy's crazy, you just now figure that out? Read Hebrews chapter 4 and 5. It'll take you probably five minutes or less. Just get in a quiet space sometime today, maybe tonight, tomorrow, whatever. Read Hebrews chapter 4 and 5. I don't have time this morning to go into chapter 5. I'm going to stay focused on chapter 4. But if you want to understand Jesus as priest, read Hebrews chapter 4 and 5. Why is this important? Well... In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, and I'm going to give you four truths about the person of Jesus Christ as our priest. 
number one, Jesus, according to Hebrews chapter four, verse 14, Jesus is in heaven. If there were nothing after death, then Jesus would still be dead and there is absolutely no reason for us to be in this room. And when Jesus said to that thief on the cross, you're going to be with me, that phrase, be with me, would be biblically, logically impossible if Jesus were still dead. But listen, Jesus is in heaven. And all of us in this room are going to spend the majority of our lives in eternity. And we're going to be residents of one of two places for all of eternity. And there's no switching. Either because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, based on what he did upon the cross, you're going to spend eternity in heaven, or if you reject the person of Jesus Christ, do not believe what he did on the cross is true, then you're going to be separated for all eternity from Jesus in a place called hell, and there are no third options. And I believe you're here, and I believe you're joining us online. Because you desire to make sure biblically and to be encouraged biblically that you believe the right truth about the person of Jesus Christ because you want to be with him forever in heaven. And I want to do this morning what the writer of the book of Hebrews did, chapter 4, chapter 5. I want to encourage you, no matter what you go through in life, hold on to Jesus. Of all the experiences you have had, will have, and are going to have, Hold on to Jesus. Do not let anything that happens to you or around you in life cause you to let go of the person of Jesus Christ. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, hold fast to your confession. Why? Because Jesus is in heaven. That's why. Second, not only do I want you to understand that Jesus is in heaven, if you stay in verse 14, you also read a phrase that says, Jesus is the Son of God. The resurrection happened because of who Jesus is. And those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ have made Jesus the object of our faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is not subjective. That I'm eventually going to get there, I'm trying to be better, whatever. It's objective. Everything about our lives is true because of the object of our faith. Your faith is only as strong as its object, and there's no stronger object of faith than the person of Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Scripture says he's the Son of God. He's the one you turn to. In situations and seasons of life that you can't figure out, you can't handle, and you can't get out of. How do you know that? The thief on the cross did that. That's how I know that. Let's keep going. Verse 15. Not only is Jesus in heaven, not only does the writer of the book of Hebrews tell us that Jesus is the Son of God, he also helps us understand that Jesus is without sin. Now, if you're okay writing in your copy of Scripture, somewhere in the margin, either at the top or the bottom of the page, I want you to write one word. When you see the fact that Jesus was tempted yet without sin, I want you to write the word empathetic okay and and for me I'm choosing that over empathy because that says more to me that of all my experiences of life all the days of my life the good ones the bad ones and all the ones in between Jesus is empathetic toward all of the struggles that I go through in life that you go through in life in fact what the writer of the book of Hebrews is communicating Jesus understands the challenges of life better than you understand them because Jesus was tempted in all the ways that we're tempted, but he was without sin. To me, that's incredible. That helps me understand and appreciate even to a greater degree that Jesus is a king like no other king. And then in verse 16, the fact that Jesus is in heaven the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is without sin, it is Jesus who opens the way to God. That's why the writer of the book of Hebrews encourages us to draw near to God. And when you draw near to God, here's what happens. You begin to find the grace and the mercy that you need to live your life in all the chaos and the confusion of this world. If Jesus were not alive, how are you going to find the grace and mercy that you need from Jesus if he's still dead? And I don't know about you, but... 
any day and all day, any moment of any day, every day of my life, I have good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. And that good news tells me the grace that I need that I can never exhaust comes from Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. But there's this conversation that took place. And, and, and Jesus says, listen, you're going to be with me and there's nothing that can prevent you, not even crucifixion and death and the grave that can prevent you from being with me. And then the writer of the book of Hebrews just starts to unpack what that means. So read chapter 4, read chapter 5. I was just about finished preparing for a couple of weeks ago, last Sunday, and today. And, and I'm looking for something else. And, and I stumble across this article by Trevin Wax. He's somebody that, that I read. Uh, he's a guy younger than me, and you're thinking pretty much everybody's younger than you. But he's younger than me. And the title to his article, and I love this title, Generational Identity Crisis. I saw that title, I said, I gotta read this. And as I'm reading through this thing, Generational Identity Crisis, what Trevin Wax wrote about is all of the identity markers that we've had historically have been removed from our culture. And he talks about family and he talks about friends. You think about the word friend, that word means, uh, it means something different for us today in this de decade than it meant a couple of decades ago. Family, friends, community. We, we are desperate for community because we don't really know where to go to find community. And then history, we're, we're re rewriting history. I don't know how do you re Right, history, but it's a sermon for another day. I think Trevin is right. We have removed those identity markers. Now, it was his article. He wrote it his way. If I were to write it, I would have put faith first, but it's his article. He's welcome to get it wrong. But I think part of what he wrote was right. And when you, when you remove all of those identity markers, where do you turn to for identity in life? And on this, he's right. We usually turn within. And when you turn within, here's what almost always happens. You begin to find your identity in life based on your failures. You've had conversations with people just like I have. And at some point in the conversation, you will hear, yeah, I've been through some tough things in life. I'm, I'm actually divorced. Life defined by failure. You've had conversations that I have, you know, I lost my job, life defined by failure. I'm broke. I had a conversation with someone this past week on how I'm gonna get out of the financial mess I'm in. I'm lonely. Or because of where we are in the culture of the 21st century, there are addictions that we wrestle with and you fill in the blank for whatever it is that you wrestle with. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus has the power to lift you out of a life defined by failure to a life defined by faith. And only Jesus can do that. See, a life of failure is defined by what I can't do. A life of faith is defined by what Jesus did. And because of what Jesus did, I am, and many of you in this room, many of you who are joining us online, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean I live a perfect life. It doesn't mean I'm trying to live a better life. It means that I live a life that's been forgiven of sin, and Jesus described that as abundant life and eternal life. That's the life I live. Those of you who are here Sunday after Sunday or join us online Sunday after Sunday know that I'm reading a, a devotion this year written by A.W. Tozer, and the devotions on Jesus as the Son of God. I, I found a quote from Tozer in another resource, and I thought, I need to share this with you today. In the context of worshiping on Resurrection Sunday, here's the statement. The most important thing about you is what comes into your mind when you think about Jesus. You might want to take a picture of that or jot that down. The most important thing about you, not failures, not your position in life relationally, 
It's what you think when you think about Jesus. I, I, I've said for the last couple of weeks, every person in the room, every person joining us online, every person that you and I know, every person that'll be at the dinner table today on Easter Sunday, falls into one of three groups when it comes to faith in the person of Jesus Christ. You know people, I know people who are antagonistic. And in the culture we live in today, they're becoming more and more antagonistic. There are people who are indifferent to Jesus, and I'm not really good with the word indifferent. I think the word dismissive is better. And what do I mean by dismissive? Well, if, if you'll read Luke chapter four when Jesus read the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue of Nazareth, when he said, today this, this is being fulfilled in, in your hearing, the people in the synagogue said, whoa, wait, hang on, wait a minute, whoa. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this Joseph's son? You see, what they did, they, they humanized Jesus. And when you humanize Jesus, you don't view Jesus as God's one and only son. When you humanize Jesus, it's easy to be dismissive toward Jesus. The third group, and I think this is where most of us are, you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You live a life of faith. Most important thing about you is what comes into your mind when you think about Jesus. Judy texted me this past week, and she put in the text, did you know that there was a, an exhibit in D.C. with things from the tomb of King Tut? Now, I, I, was, I was studying. I didn't want to get back and forth in a, a long text conversation. I don't know if you know this or not. If you actually have a phone, there are numbers that you can press in the right order, and it rings another phone, and you can actually talk to a person. You can have a conversation. See, sometimes you go to church and you learn stuff, see? So, so I called Judy and I said, where'd you, where'd you hear that? And she tells me, and she said, well, I said, well, listen, do some research and I'm gonna do some. Now, when a guy does research about an exhibit, what's the guy looking for? There you go, price, how much is this gonna cost? Yeah, I'm not, I don't really care where it is or how long it's gonna take to get there, about five hours, it's in DC. All I wanna know is what's this gonna set me back? Now, as I'm researching and as Judy's researching, I find out that all of the stuff there, it's not from the tomb. This is replicas of things that they found in the tomb. Now, if you've already been, sorry. If you got tickets, I don't know if you can eBay those things or not, but it's just replicas. So, you know, I, I'm, I, again, I pushed the numbers. Judy answered, miracle, and I said, hey, I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to go up there just to see replicas. And she said, yeah, I found that too, and forget it. But I found something while I was researching this whole thing. Howard Carter is the British archaeologist who found the, the tomb of King Tut. And, and when he walked in that tomb, and I quote, Howard Carter. This happened almost 100 years ago, or a little over 100 years ago, actually. He said that he found an impressive golden tomb. Outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem, I've been there a number of times, some of you have been there. You can go to a place called Gordon's Calvary, and when you go through the gate, you can go to your right and walk up a little path, and there's a place to sit. And when you sit, you can look out over the bus station, the local bus station, with all the confusion, chaos, it's filthy, and you can look to a hill, and on that hill, there's very obviously a face of a skull. And I believe with every bone, breath, joint, sinew, muscle in my body, that that is Golgotha. That's the place that Jesus was crucified. And when I have people there who say, why don't they clean it up and get rid of the bus station? Listen, that's the way it was when Jesus was crucified. It was loud. There were people walking by, hurling insults at Jesus. That's the way the Romans wanted it. 
They wanted everybody to understand as you pass by, if you don't do what we say you do, this is what happens. So it's, I think, true to history. When, when, when you leave that place, you can walk through a, gor- a garden and, and you walk down to kind of a lower level and then you go through a queue, a line, and there is a tomb. Part of it's been filled in with blocks. There's a small door to get in. And when you walk inside, it's not really impressive, but it is empty. And the reason it's empty is because the empty tomb matters. It's empty because Jesus is alive. Jesus is a king like no other king to the praise and the glory of God. What hope, what encouragement, What grace, what forgiveness, what mercy. An alive Jesus who makes the life of a follower of Jesus Christ reality. God, I know there are a lot of people in this room, people who are joining us online, who know you and trust you and follow you. But I would never stand here on any Sunday, Easter Sunday, And for one moment, think everybody I speak to knows you. And God, there's a burden when I share the message. There's a burden in my heart because I do not want any person to ever sit in one sermon or a series of sermons and find themselves separated from you for all eternity in a place called hell. Listen, if you're not sure about the empty tomb, if you're not sure about this whole resurrection thing, faith thing, Christian thing, I want to help you. I know it's a little busy on our campus today. There's a place to take pictures with your family in the foyer, do that. But if you go all the way to that back wall as you walk out of these doors, you're going to see a big white desk. We call that next step station. We have pastors there. We have volunteers there. And if you have questions about how do you have this relationship with Jesus, if you have questions about, I really want to go to heaven, I I want to know what Jesus told that man on the cross, what's true of him, I want that to be true of me. Let someone help you. Ask those questions. I know you got a lot on the calendar today, I get it. But the most important event that could happen in your heart and your life today is to move from death to life by putting your faith in Jesus. God, I know that there are Christians in this room who are struggling with something in their lives. We all struggle. Maybe today they've begun to realize that this Jesus who is in heaven, the Son of God without sin, is able to understand the challenges they're living in, is able to be empathetic toward the difficulties of life. And maybe God, instead of trying to handle things themselves, it's time to hand that over to Jesus. May that happen, God. Father, thank you for the privilege of being in this place. Thank you for the privilege of being in your presence, not just on Resurrection Sunday, but every day of our lives. We live the life of faith because the object of our faith is Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, resurrected, and returning. In his powerful name I pray, amen. Would you stand with me? Pastor Josh and our worship team is going to lead us in one final song, and then he'll dismiss us. Sing with me, church. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me 
died all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sing, Lord, now indeed I find. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Cause Jesus paid it all. To him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat that Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Church, pray with me. Jesus, to You be all glory, honor, and praise. You truly are a king like no other king. Father, I pray that you are honored today by what has happened in this room. But Lord, I pray that what has happened in this room doesn't stay in this room. I pray that we leave this place changed. And that we tell the whole world that we know the risen king. And it's in your son's name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Church, we love you. And we'll see you next week. Happy Easter.